Hello and welcome to 25 Concepts in Anthropology. I'm Nick Herriman and today we're going to talk about the unconscious mind. We're going to talk about this as a way into the idea of psychological anthropology. Okay, so psycho psychological anthropology and the idea of the unconscious mind derives from a larger idea of psychoanalysis or what we might also call Freudianism. So psychoanalysis or Freudianism obviously has been dominated by Freud's ideas. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is Freudianism, not Freud uh, per se or Freud specifically, just the sort of school of ideas that he has um, inspired. Now it's, he's so influential in the field of psychoanalysis it's hard to think of psychoanalysis without Freud. I have to warn you though, the ideas I'm going to talk about will sound absurd if you've never heard them before. And they'll especially sound absurd when presented in short summaries like this. And another caveat, I don't actually use these ideas, <coughs> excuse me, I don't actually use Freudianism in my own uh, research, so I'm not an advocate per se. Nevertheless, I think it's very useful for us to have a deeper understanding, and today I hope to give you the first steps towards that. The principal ideas, the principal ideas of psychoanalysis or uh, Freudianism is firstly, excuse me, is firstly that there is an unconscious mind. We'll get to this later, but um, Freud himself insisted that most of your thought is unconscious. You can think of it like an iceberg. Your conscious thoughts, what you're aware of thinking right now, is just the tip of the iceberg. Most of your thoughts, like the base of the iceberg, remain submerged. That's a pretty powerful idea. It's a pretty powerful idea because it's suggesting, uh, as I've talked about earlier, that you're not the master of your own mind. In other words, you don't really control what you're thinking. You only control a very little bit of your thought. Okay, that's idea number one, that there is an unconscious mind. The second idea is that experiences of socialization and childhood, especially the period of infancy, let's say up to three years old, dominate your unconscious mind. And those of those experiences, the most important experiences are ones of trauma and conflict. Trauma and conflict. And of that trauma and conflict, the majority of the experiences were sexual in nature. And sexual here we mean in a larger sense of uh, sexual, um, not meaning, for example, penis being inserted into vagina, but rather uh, anything that provides gratification. So sexual in this context can include um, uh, suckling, sucking milk from the boo as a baby does, um, defecating, that is pooing, going to the toilet, and urinating. Okay, they're the principal ideas. Um, the best way to start this, there are many ways in, we're just going to start with the stages of development. We all start, you and I started, according to Freud, at the oral stage. That is the stage when we are getting gratification from the breast. Um, all we know is the breast, mum, me. It's all one thing, if you like. You can hardly separate it out. In fact, you have no sense of separate identity. You have no sense of id, as we're going to talk about later, during this oral phase, which lasts till about the age of uh, a year and a half, according to Freud. And it all comes crashing down depending on when you're being weaned. As soon as you're weaned, as soon as you don't get um, the boob as you wanted it, you get, have to go cold turkey or however you're weaned, you move out of the oral phase into the next phase, which is the anal phase. And according to Freud, this is associated with toilet training for defecation. In other words, toilet training for pooing. The main idea here is that as you are being toilet trained for pooing, the focus of your attention is on your anus and the pleasures, etc. you get if you like gratification you get from uh, from pooing basically from without holding poo and then pooing that sort of gratification so that's the anal phase that comes to an end 
uh, after you've been successfully toilet trained and you move into the phallic stage. The phallic stage um, is associated with toilet training for weeing, for urinating. And this uh, lasts for about, let's say, three to six years old. So even some six year olds uh, uh, have issues with uh, controlling their weeing. And during this period, your attention is focused on the penis and the vagina. Now, for the first time, boys and girls in this age become aware, according to the theory. I'm not going to say according to the theory anymore. I'm just, from now on, just assume I'm saying according to the theory. It's not according to me. According to the theory, from now on, at this stage, your attention, um, for the first time, you're aware of the difference between boys and girls because your focus is on the penis or the vagina. And that's, um, if you like, the sight that you're you're learning to control, to stop urinating. So that's the phallic stage. Um, the next two stages, the latent stage and the genital stage, uh, in anthropology, we're not interested in. We don't care. The big stages for us are oral, anal, and phallic. Okay, the stages of development. Um, now, the basic, you, you've heard of this before, um, an oral type person, probably the expression anal type personality. The idea is that you, if you're anal, you didn't progress through the anal stage properly uh, maybe your mother beat you uh, when you, if you soiled your pants, if you did a poo in your pants, and your mother beat you, you will go through, you'll become an anal type person, which is associated with retention, which means you want everything spick and span and clean, that you hoard money, you're a hoarder, so that's retention, that is retaining the feces, retaining the poo, or the opposite, and Freud is careful here, he always gets both ways, you can have both ways, which is incredibly messy, that is like soiling your pants is incredibly messy, messy. in the same way if you're an incredibly messy person, um, you are said to be uh, an anal type personality. So you can be anal type clean or anal type dirty if you like. Um, if you're, for example, a lot of boys are always playing with their penises, even after they're six years old, this might indicate they had some sort of traumas during their phallic stage. Um, maybe, again, they weed their pants and somebody mocked them or made fun of them or even pushed them or assaulted them, you know, hit them or something. So they might um, uh, associate that stage with uh, the, um, the trauma with the penis, in which case they reject it. They think penises are disgusting and try and stay away from them or they become very attached. Again, Freud can have it both ways. Okay. Uh, let's go past stages of development and move on to the structure of the unconscious mind. As I said, the unconscious is the largest sphere of mental life. And I think that's a direct quote from Freud. Now, you and me have an unconscious mind. Um, so let's just say there's an unconscious mind. On top of that is a pre-conscious mind. And then there's a conscious mind. So this is the conscious mind is stuff you're conscious of. Pre-conscious is stuff that's going to emerge into your conscious mind, and unconscious stuff is stuff you'll never really be aware of, thoughts you'll never be aware of. So now we're going to focus. So it's a three, three part, um, three layered model, if you like. Now in this bottom layer, again there are three layers. The first layer, or well, the first layer, the very bottom layer, is id, your id, which is selfish and demanding. Um, that's if you like. Your, um, the, the baby in you that wants gratification for everything now. Then you have within your unconscious mind an ego, which you're entirely unaware of again, because it's in your unconscious mind, which is balanced and still in touch with reality, and a super ego, which, get, which has unrealistic demands. It might say, don't you ever poo ever again, that's disgusting. You must never wee, you must never hold your penis, that's disgusting. Um, so this is your super ego. If you like, um, it's like one of those cartoon comics. On the one side you have the good angel, which is your id. On the other side you have your bad angel, angel which is your super ego. They're both demanding stuff, and, and luckily you have an ego, which is more balanced. And so the id, for example, um, see uh, what am I saying? You, you want to go to the toilet. You have an urge to go to the toilet to wee. You're id saying just. Just wait now, just piss now, just piss now. Your super ego is going, you disgusting animal, you disgusting animal, you can't do that. They're both blabbering away. And your ego is saying, hang on, why don't we just go to the toilet and do it there? That'll be, that'll satisfy 
that'll satisfy both of you if I just go to the toilet. But that's all unconscious, still unconscious. So the three parts of your unconscious. All right, so we're going to start with the unconscious mind. Now let's look at desire. As infants, we all have um, desires. And it's important to have desires, according to Freud. That gives you psychic energy. If you didn't have these desires, you, would, you wouldn't probably get up in the morning. You wouldn't have uh, thought. You have two kinds of desires from your id. One is, um, so we're talking about bad bad angel now, <laughs> bad Santa, bad angel. One is for possessive love, which is like, I want to, um, like with your like with your mother, you want to possess your mother when you're a baby. I only want her, I don't want anybody else to get near my mother. That's uh, possessive love. You also have Thanatos, which is a destroy and kill kind of desire. So if somebody else touches your mother, another child or a sibling comes along, a younger sibling comes along, then it's not uncommon for kids to say, I want to kill that. I want to kill my younger brother. And that's the, that's the that's the sort of Thanatos, the those unconscious thoughts for Thanatos from the id bubbling all the way up into the conscious mind. Um, if you're hungry, your id tells you to eat, which is um, something that's repressed in the oral stage. That's, you know, your consumption is repressed in the oral stage. To defecate, to poo, that's repressed in the anal stage, and to masturbate and urinate. Masturbate here meaning just um, holding on to a sexual organ, not necessarily climaxing with an orgasm, holding on to a sexual organ or urinating. Okay, are you still with me? Let's move on. So, all these desires are unsociable. If you see somebody attractive um, walking across campus, your immediate response is to run up on, jump on top of them and fornicate. <laughs> That's your possessive love. And you see somebody else kissing them, your immediate impulse is to go and kill them. And you're hungry and you want to eat a hamburger on the way, you all go to the toilet, so you're pooing and weeing on the way. That's all the, they're all the desires you can have all at once. You can imagine running across campus like that. Wouldn't work, you get kicked out, sent to an asylum. And the reason why is because it's, you're not acting in a socialized way. All these desires, according to Freud, are natural. The desire to go and jump on that person, fornicate, um, kill the other person to eat and poo and wee at all at the same time. That's just natural according to Freud. But you can't have a society with people running around doing that all the time. And you need to be socialized. These desires need to be repressed in order to have society. So um, we, in other words, we need to be socialized to be social. It sounds a bit weird. Sounds obvious. But, uh, but you know, on the other hand, there's no implication here that we're born social creatures. In fact, we're born animals and we're turned into social humans. Um, part of that, I'm going to bring in this theory, it's not so important, but here we'll do it anyway, is the identification and object choice. A young boy, uh, a young male, a boy, identifies with his father. He wants to be his father and chooses his mother as an object of affection. And from then on in life, he will go for women, according to Freud, that remind him of his mother. That, that's a sort of healthy, well, moderately healthy, healthy, non-pathological kind of uh, individual there. Uh, female, young girl, will identify with her mother and um, the object choice of that female will be her father. Okay, so that's the idea of identification, object choice. So again, we need to be socialized to be social. But the problem is socializing, socialization causes trauma. According to the theory, you cannot be socialized. You can't be turned into a social human. If, you, if you're socialized, I know I'm socialized because I haven't been locked up yet. Um, it's a result of trauma. And that requires desires. Again, the desire to run up, fornicate, kill, who we eat all at once, whatever it is, has to be sublimated, has to be repressed. Now, all this repression, all this pre-conscious working to keep up all these terrible, terrible thoughts from the unconscious to keep these thoughts out of your conscious mind makes you uh, very tired, very tired. And these unconscious thoughts demand expression. They try to fool the censorship of the pre-conscious. They try and fall to, to somehow slip up and get into your conscious mind. 
Um, now, how do they go about doing that? Um, they can express themselves, for example, in dreams, in what are called Freudian slips, the famous one being from that Chevy Chase movie. He sees a woman with large breasts that he's attracted to. Instead of saying, it's a bit nippy, it's a bit cold, he said, it's a bit nipply. <laughs> so that's uh, a Freudian slip there. And it can also be expressed in clinical symptoms. Now, I'm going to give you two examples. Stay with me, we're going down to the nitty gritty here. First example, this comes from Freud's work, The Unconscious Reality. Great title, The Unconscious Reality. Uh, it refers to a 14 year old girl who's a patient of his who's dressed sexually. Sorry, sex silly. Um, that's my word, not the word he used. Maybe in a seductive manner. And she complained of leg pains and quotes, without being asked, exposed her calf. Her calf, well, back in the 1890s in Vienna, any res no respectful woman would show her calf. She described a feeling as though something was stuck into it and was stuck into her, I think it's supposed to be stuck into her, I think it's her, so it was stuck into her and was shaking her and it made her whole body stiff. Now Freud is too much of a, a late 20th century gentleman to say it, but what he's getting at here is sex. The girl has sexual desires that are expressed in these clinical symptoms of leg pains and shaking. She's trying to enact, her unconscious mind is making her body enact the sexual act, according to Freud. Um, so her unconscious mind could hoodwink or fool the censorship of the preconscious, allowing a fantasy, an unconscious fantasy, to emerge into the consciousness under the innocent disguise of a complaint. She thought she had an illness. In fact, according to Freud, the problem is she has this unconscious desire for sexual contact. Um, okay, another case from the same article. A 14-year-old boy um, came to see Mr. Sigmund Freud. His father had threatened him for masturbating. Um, imagine he caught him or something. The father was a hard and angry a uh, man who had divorced his mother and brought home a young wife. Immediately after this, the young boy develops a nervous tick, um, hysterical vomiting, I won't do that, and headaches. Okay, what went wrong, according to Freud? He did a simple examination of the boy. He said, okay, shut your eyes and tell me what you see. And now what the boy said was he, he imagined playing drafts thinking about moves which cannot be made. And then he's seeing a dagger which belongs to his father. And then he sees a sickle and a scythe. Sickle and scythe are instruments that were used, hand instruments for harvesting wheat and other crops. Okay. Now, Freud thinks, okay, there must be some meaning to this. The sickle, in Greek mythology, the god Zeus, used a sickle to castrate, to cut off his father's penis. A scythe is associated with Kronos, who ate his children. So, the boy has an unconscious fantasy about chopping off his father's penis. His father is represented, is, he thinks of as, the boy thinks of as sort of like Kronos, um, a kind of monster that would eat his own children. And making forbidden move in drafts, Freud's pretty clear about this. This must be playing with genitals, in other words, masturbating. So the dream is an expression of these unconscious traumas. And this ties into the famous Oedipus complex, which dominates in males. Um, now, the basic idea of the Oedipus complex, and I'll wrap it up here, the basic idea of the Oedipus, Oedipus complex. If you're a young boy, you're a young boy, you are very close with your mother while you're going through the oral stage. Now, you get through the anal stage and you get and you arrive at the genital stage and suddenly you're becoming aware of penises and vaginas. You become aware that your mother has a vagina, father has a penis, but you have a penis. How come the child thinks a mother has a vagina, a father has a penis and I have a penis? I know the child thinks, my father must have castrated my mother. My mother once had a penis and my father chopped it off. 
I'm going to stop here for a second. Sounds a bit strange, but in defence of Freud, kids do have thoughts that we might think are strange. I used to think that if I went to the toilet, I might accidentally, when I'm defecating, I might actually give birth to a baby. So I used to check in the toilet before I flushed each time that there wasn't a baby in there. In other words, children have, have strange ideas. Okay, the little boy gets to the stage, um, becomes aware. Now he's frightened of, he has affection for his mother. Now we call it sexual. It's not sexual like um, insert penis into vagina and fornicate kind of sexual. It's more um, need to be close, possess that kind of sexual, that gratifying kind of feeling. Um, he wants to possess his mother. He wants his father to go away. And the, the idea is that um, well, that is a complex that crops up a lot in uh, men, especially in later life. I mean, a, a typical Oedipus complex will be, um, for example, uh, a hatred of, of other men, particularly elder men. Um, according to Freud, oh, I won't go into the, into the detail. But anyway, that, that's the Oedipus complex. Now you can see how it all ties into this larger idea of the unconscious. And this idea has a lot of applications in anthropology and in other fields. Okay, I hope you're still with me. It was a long uh, presentation today, but I look forward to your company for more 25 concepts in anthropology.